If you're not buying bottled gravy, jarred bechamel sauce, or cheese sauce in a tube, <laughs> then why are you buying bottled cold sauces for salads? Because really, a salad dressing is just a cold sauce for summer, something you can definitely make yourself and leave out all those unnecessary ingredients. It's summer salad dressings today on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cooks Code. Boom! Hey, welcome back to the Carefree Cooks Code, everyone. Uh, we This is the weekly show for the methods, the techniques, and insights into better food and cooking. And of course, we're live every Tuesday at noon Eastern. And you can find all my past videos in the archive on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash chef.todd.more slash videos. And if you want to see what I'm cooking, <laughs> every single night of the week for dinner because we're not going out anymore. Uh, you want to see what I'm cooking every night and how I did it? Then follow Chef Todd Moore on Instagram as well uh, because we're the carefree cooks. You could say it. I create my own recipes. I bring friends and family together. I learn every time I cook. I create my own cooking style because I practice pro methods and I love my cooking, right? That's what it's all about, and I'm so glad that we're back together again examining the hows and whys behind cooking so you can become truly free in your kitchen and start cooking with creativity and confidence. But you know, part of the journey toward becoming a carefree cook is actually making many of the ingredients, the condiments, and, and the sauces that you've probably been buying in bottles for many years. And Bottles, it's true, they're lesser quality, but more expensive than the things that you can make at home with just some simple ingredients. And today, I'm going to show you how to do that. So stick around. It should be a good show. But uh, first, uh, we've got a true or a false for you today. Hey, remember, every week on the Carefree Cooks Code, we do a what am I? Or kitchen gadget tool, things like that, or fruit or vegetable, or a true or false question for you to reply in the comments section below. So today is going to be a true or false question, and we can thank Tony for the question today. So let me ask you, true or false in the comments section below, you do not know what you are doing, Todd. Tell me in the comments section below, is this statement true or false? And I'll have the answer for you at the end of today's show. Carefree cooks, <laughs> we make our own cheese sauce from scratch because we know how to make a basic bechamel sauce with roux and milk, like I show you in web cooking classes lesson week 12. And once you learn how to do tomato concasse from web cooking classes lesson week 10, then you start making your own tomato sauces and you never buy jarred tomato sauce again. And at that very moment, that a carefree cook discovers the secret behind making their own barbecue sauces from our lesson week 14, then you never buy your own barbecue sauce again. So, with all that happening in the carefree cook's journey, why? Oh, why? Tell me, why do so many home cooks continue to buy bottled salad dressing when it's so much easier to make your own cold sauces for summer? For the longest time, Heather and I have bought this very popular brand of dressing. But, you know, when I started reading the ingredient list, th thinking about whether I would actually add those ingredients to a dressing I made myself, would I really add some of these things? Well, it was a really quick decision 
to, to make it on my own. Here, here is Todd's honey balsamic salad dressing. I bought this cool little bottle on, online somewhere uh, and I start making my own. I'm gonna share with you the ingredients and the proportions for my honey balsamic vinaigrette. <laughs> Oh, there we go, uh, right here that I reached for at the end of today's show. So stick around for that for sure. Uh, look, here's the idea. In the salad dressings aisle, I mean, there are endless choices for you, right? And if they can make all those flavors, then so can you, right? But you would probably leave out all the binders and the fake ingredients or do you think you would actually go shopping for some, some fresh xanthium gum? Hmm, where do I get me some good fresh xanthium gum to add to my own dressings? This isn't the way that you would make it at home, so why are you buying it that way? Don't, don't think of a dressing as a bottled condiment, like, like ketchup or mustard, you know, maybe you do buy those. Think of your salad dressings as a cold sauce. I mean, you don't buy bechamel sauce, right? You don't buy your cooked sauces, am I correct? So why are you buying your cold sauces? Because if you start to think about your salad as an uncooked entree, you know, in the summer, you're eating lighter, your salad might be an entree, but it's an uncooked entree. So if you have an uncooked entree, then the dressing has gotta be your, the sauce for your dressing, uh, for your entree, right? So if you think about your salad and your salad dressing as if it were a cooked entree and a cooked sauce, then you might be giving your dressing a little bit more respect. I mean, admit it, cheese sauce gets a heck of a lot more admiration and expect and respect than a vinaigrette does, right? Nobody gets as excited about a vinaigrette as they do a cheese sauce. You know it's true. Well, maybe the lactose intolerant, but that's another story. So look, let's, let's talk for a minute about salad dressings and, and really delve into what makes them tick because this will enable you to start making any dressing you want. And a, a strict definition is that a salad dressing is a liquid or a semi-liquid that's used to season salads. It, it's that simple. And if you remember the difference, between flavoring and seasoning from my five skills taught in culinary school class, this will help you a lot because your dressing, it serves the same function as a sauce. Think about it. A sauce adds moisture. They both add flavor. Uh, they both contribute a better texture and mouthfeel. They both add appearance to your cooked dish or your salad, and they should work in harmony with the other ingredients. So. This should change your mind a little bit about really not caring about some of these salads, but start caring about them the way that you do your sauces because there are four categories of salad dressings and this is the way that we teach it in culinary school. Learn the four categories and then you can start creating your own. So the four categories are vinaigrettes, thickened dressings, emulsified dressings, cooked dressings. Those are the four, okay? The four types of dressing. But here's the important part uh, uh, about salad dressings that, that can actually in some ways make them harder to create or at least harder to create a really, really good one than a cooked sauce because the flavors in salad dressings generally aren't changed by heat. So the quality of the ingredients are absolutely necessary. It's one of the places in my home that I spend a few extra dollars on olive oil, on balsamic vinegar, on the things that go into my dressing because they're not changed by cooking. And all this becomes a lot easier when you start to realize that salad dressings, no matter which category they come from, they all have just a few basic elements that bring them all together. So let's talk about the basic elements. You've got four categories and they're good, coordination, and three basic elements, right? So the first is oil. And the first promise you can make yourself, if you wanna make a really nice dressing at home, let's get away from the canola oil, the safflower oil, the vegetable oils, things like that in your salad dressings. They're absolutely flavorless. I mean, they, they don't contribute anything. And some of these really cheap bottled dressings, 
They might use corn or soybean oil, uh, some of the cheaper polyunsaturated fats that may not be really good for you. Think about using less oils in the dressings, but also think about expanding your repertoire toward a, a walnut oil, a truffle oil, a peanut oil, um, hazelnut oils, right? You get very distinct flavors from these things. Uh, the second thing is an acid. And again, your acid, think about this generally in categories of ingredients. Your acid does not have to be balsamic vinegar. For goodness sake, not every dressing in the world is balsamic vinegar. As a matter of fact, it doesn't have to be vinegar at all. Your home created dressing, I don't know, it could use citrus juices if you want as the acid, right? Acid is a category. You can use wines, you can use liqueurs to play this role in your salad dressing. But no matter which of the acids that you choose, what kind of flavored oil you choose, you still need to create that flavor profile in your seasonings. And here, here is where you really get to expand past those herbs and spices that you would normally use and start thinking about using some of the condiments in your refrigerator, maybe roasted aromatics, right? Think about a roasted garlic dressing, e even cooked proteins can go into your created dressing. Cooked proteins, you're like, what, Chef Todd? What? Did I hear someone say hot bacon dressing? <laughs> yeah, uh, even though the days of the salad bar are probably gone, uh, hot bacon dressing w was a staple of it. And that's an example of a cooked protein in your dressing. So you put all those things together, you put your oil, you, you put your acid, you put your seasonings together and you've got the first category of salad dressings. You've created a vinaigrette. But since the vinegar and the oil don't mix very well, they're only gonna stay together for a short amount of time. You got to shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it. Bum, 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 bum. It's a temporary, all right. <laughs> Easy. Uh, it's a temporary emulsification. It's a mechanical emulsification. You can shake things vigorously and it'll stay together for a short amount of time. Uh, do you remember the good seasons cruet, right? Did you have one of these in your household as a kid, as an adult, <laughs> maybe today? Well, I think every house in America had one of these in the 1970s, but these packets, <laughs> these little packets, they are filled with guar gum, xanthium gum, maltodextrin, things like that. If I was whipping up my own, I wouldn't go shopping for some fresh guar gum. <laughs> you know, I would keep the ingredients simple and that's what you start to eliminate. You increase your enjoyment. You eliminate the things that you really don't need. So, all right, let's talk about the next category. What happens to addressing if you add a thickening agent to it, right? I'm making this analogy of, of winter hot sauces to summer cold sauces, salad dressings. So there's a thickening agent in a winter sauce, always is, it has to stick to the food. But what about a thickening agent for your dressing so it sticks to foods? And this is where we get into the next two types of dressing, emulsified and thickened. The last type also of the four is a cooked dressing. And this would use a cooked thickener. Okay. I'm lumping all these three together, but let me explain. If you simmer some soy sauce and if, simmer some soy sauce. Oh, such great alliteration. Don't you? If you simmer some soy, simmer some soy sauce, simmer some soy sauce, simmer some soy sauce, simmer some soy sauce. Simmer, I like that. All right. We're going to write a song later, but if you simmer some soy sauce and then thicken it with a cornstarch slurry, and then you let it cool, well, you can now use that cooked condiment as your acid for, let's say, add a sesame oil to it. It's a sesame oil and thickened soy sauce dressing, right? Cool, not something you'd find on a shelf. And if you wanted something sweeter, maybe you would try a, a cooked fruit compote, cook down some strawberries, some blueberries, uh, apricots. This is a good thing to do when your fruit kind of goes bad. Cook it down into a compote. Uh, you can even thicken it with honey or molasses. These things also act as thickeners in dressings. Uh, or go, uh, go dairy, go cold, go sour cream, go yogurt. 
uh, even bloomed gelatin, a little powdered gelatin sprinkled in some water, let it bloom, whisk it into your dressing. That, that's a dietary staple for a lot of people with, with dietary restrictions, right? So whatever the ingredients are that are necessary for your diet or your desires for that matter, you can fit them into the four categories and three elements in just about every salad dressing. So uh, let's, let's talk about this though, thickening, okay? A thickened dressing is different than emulsified dressing. An emulsified dressing uses an emulsifying agent, and this is an ingredient that helps bring together two unmixable items, like oil and vinegar in a vinaigrette, right? Shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it, and it stays together. But tomorrow morning, or probably within about an hour, it's all gonna be separated again. And while a vinaigrette is a temporary emulsification, adding an emulsifying agent will hold these two things in suspension permanently. That's the idea, that's what mayonnaise is. Mayonnaise is eggs and oil, two things that don't normally mix together, but with, with an emulsifying agent. Uh, same thing with Caesar dressing. Caesar dressing is eggs and vinegar, but it's held together by an egg yolk or factory lecithin. Lecithin is the natural emulsifier that holds those things together. But here, the quality of the ingredients, while still being very, very important, they matter a lot less than the emulsification process, okay? It doesn't matter how you shake up a vinaigrette. It doesn't matter the technique. I could do it underhand, I could do it behind my head. It doesn't matter. The, the result is gonna be the same. But it certainly does matter how you create the emulsification for a Caesar dressing or a good pesto sauce. And this is a skill. So, you know, here's my goal. This week, I wanna help you save some of your money because this will save you money. I want you to save some of your valuable time chasing around the grocery store. I want to help you increase your enjoyment, uh, your pride in cooking. And it might possibly improve your health too all just by starting to make your own salad dressings instead of buying the bottles at your grocery store. This can do all those things for you. And really, it's just another piece of the puzzle in trying to break the Carefree Cooks code because once you start making your own cold sauces for summer, that's what I consider them, cold sauces for summer, you're gonna have the flavor combinations that aren't available in a store. I mean, geez, you can't, <laughs> You can't pour balsamic vinaigrette on everything, right? <laughs> you can't, you can try, but if you wanna match the salad and the salad dressing to the things that you're cooking, this is your opportunity to do it. Because think about this, what if you're making a steamed, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, salmon. Let's do a steamed soy honey salmon. Uh, steamed soy honey salmon. That's what's in my head right now. And you want to make a side salad to match the flavor profile. Well, now you have the ability uh, to make like, like a sesame oil ginger vinaigrette. What if you simmered some ginger in soy sauce, not the alliteration that I usually like, but uh, you know, make a compound like soy sauce and then you got a ginger with sesame, it matches the meal. You get the idea? Because the real lesson today is to start thinking about your salad dressings, the, the cold sauces of summer, the same way that you would think about your hot sauces of winter. And as a carefree cook, well, you're always trying to match things, right? You're always matching dark beef gravies with, with, with beef or, or pork dishes, or, or you're, you're doing a lighter like chicken velote sauce with your chicken or fish dishes in the other seasons. But now is the time to start matching your salad dressings to the rest of the meal. So let's send, <laughs> let's send some of those bottled dressings out to pasture, ship them off to a desert ranch somewhere. We'll call it Buttermilk Ranch. <laughs> the place where salad dressing bottles are retired from your kitchen. We send them to Buttermilk Ranch. Oh, that's silly. Uh, okay, look, I, as I promised, I'll share my formula for Chef Todd's Honey Balsamic Vinaigrette. Here it is. Um, 
I do a one-to-one -one ratio of balsamic vinegar and good quality olive oil. Like I mentioned, this is something that, uh, you know, everybody spends a certain amount of money on food, but you can move dollars one way or the other. Um, and considering that the salad dressings are already expensive, I always feel like I could spend an extra buck or two on olive oil and balsamic vinegar. So I buy really, really good ones. Uh, if you look up recipes online, they will all tell you two to one oil to vinegar. It's just not necessary in my opinion. I don't need to eat that much oil, even the healthier olive oils. And it's just not necessary. I do I do a one-to-one. -one. The balsamic vinegar is so tart, it lights up your tongue so much that even though the olive oil can be flavorful or another flavored oil, it's just too much of a ratio. Anyway, I could go on, on that for another half hour. One-to-one, -one, balsamic vinegar and olive oil. A little bit of water, okay? And when I say one-to-one, -one, that means I do a half cup of each usually to make about that much dressing. Half cup olive oil, half cup balsamic vinegar. Uh, a spoonful of water, just a teaspoon, tablespoon or so. The water helps in the emulsifying properties that uh, whole grain mustard is gonna help us with. Some Worcestershire sauce, drop, drop, drop. Uh, a teaspoon or so of whole grain mustard because whole mustard seeds uh, have emulsifying properties like lecithin in egg yolks, but not nearly as strong, but they do help keep it together. I know I keep shaking this, but look, it's not, it's not coming apart. Um, I add some honey to it as much as you want for flavor. It doesn't really have that big of a, a mechanical process. The more honey you put in, the thicker the dressing will be, but you you get to a, a good amount before that happens. And I season with salt, black pepper, uh, oregano, uh, some celery seed, thyme, basil, and some onion powder. Take a screenshot if you want, but that's how I whip this up for a fraction of uh, uh, what you might see in uh, the grocery store. Okay. Hey, let's see what's going on in our Carefree Cooks community, exclusively for the lifetime members of web cooking classes this week. You think we're gonna find any summer salads in there? Let's go look. Uh, first, oh nice, uh, Maureen uh, says she knows the perfect lunch prep to practice with her chef's knife. <laughs> Do a chef salad. That way you have a nice healthy meal and you get to practice with your chef's knife. So she put all those nicely prepared ingredients together, made a nice light and healthy brunch, put the chef salad together. Nicely done, Maureen, really, really good. Uh, Mirella, hey Mirella, welcome. Uh, Mirella's just joined our community and she just posted this photo as her very first contribution to our Carefree Cooks community. Uh, I always think it takes some real huevos uh, to muster up the courage <laughs> to post in our community. People say, Sometimes just starting out, they're intimidated because some of the cooking is so inspired, is so beautiful, but I never want that to stop anyone from posting their first post because then you can look back six months or a year from now and see it and everything is a learning experience. So, Mirella's Huevos, her, her, her courage to post what she uh, made was fantastic. She's eating lighter, she's eating healthier, she's using her knife skills to make some really nice diced tomatoes, spinach, and avocado, adding it to her egg this morning. Nicely done, Morella. There's, <laughs> there's so much more waiting for you on your carefree cook's journey in web cooking classes. I'm glad you got started this way. Uh, John, John's with us. He made a Granny Smith apple and cucumber salad with spinach, red onions, tomatoes, and he just whipped up a honey Dijon dill vinaigrette for his queen. John proving that cooking is love. It's true, once again. Uh, you know, you may or may not have noticed, uh, but I have three letters after my name. I don't know. Don't go around talking about it much, to be honest. I earned them. <laughs> three little letters after my name. I earned them. And it, it's a big deal in chef circles. Something that's difficult to attain. And I'll be honest, there aren't very many of us. Those three letters mean certified culinary educator. And l let me show you what you have to do just to be allowed to take the two tests that you need to pass for certification. First, you need a two-year college degree in culinary arts. Plus, you need a four years bachelor's degree in any discipline. You need six years of college before they'll even talk to you. I, on the other hand, have a dual culinary degree in professional cooking and baking, as well as a four-year degree in broadcasting and journalism. 
Then you need 120 hours of educational development with a minimum of eight hours in curriculum planning and development, evaluation and testing, teaching methodology, and educational psychology. Then you need another 120 hours in nutrition, food safety, and sanitation, as well as supervisory management. And you also have had to have had, have had to have had at least two years as a chef de cuisine or executive chef, having supervised two full-time people in the preparation of food. I, on the other hand, have had seven years as an executive chef, and I've managed up to 60 cooks at one time. I ran a hospital kitchen feeding 8,000 people a day, and I was part of a team at the NSA feeding 30,000 per day. I've worked in some kitchens. Then you have to have 1,200 hours in direct classroom contact teaching. Well, I've spent at least twice that amount in the classroom, in front of students, hand to hand. And if you add up all my videos and all my online courses, it is a countless number of hours that I have spent teaching and researching about food and cooking. And then you have to create a video showing you teaching in the classroom. Well, of course, you know, I have no problem making videos. <laughs> I have more than a thousand of them floating around Facebook and YouTube. And then you have to take a very comprehensive written test about food, cooking, teaching, sanitation, nutrition, and supervising people. And then you get to take the three hour practical exam. And within three hours, you have to make 60 ounces of consomme. Consomme, if you don't know, is a clarified stock that takes about three hours to make. There's no rushing consomme, but you got to do this within three hours, as well as a quart of velote sauce, a quart of espanol sauce. You have to make two chicken entrees, starting from a whole chicken, demonstrating your knife skills, and two fish entrees, starting with a whole flounder to demonstrate your fish butchery skills, and you have to use at least one item from a seafood basket in these entrees. I did, by the way, the shrimp stuffed flounder pinwheels, the very same ones you see in web cooking classes lesson week six. So you got three hours to do this with uh, some guys breathing down your neck, <laughs> chefs constantly looking over your shoulder, writing things down on a clipboard, sometimes making the tsk tsk, you know, that, that sound during this test also. You need to limit the wasted food using as much as you can. You need to separate all your waste into different categories to be used in stock or thrown away. And I finished this three hour exam in two hours and 45 minutes, 15 minutes early. That's what I had to go through to get those three little letters after my name, certified culinary educator. So let's go back to today's true or false. You do not know what you're doing, Todd. Hmm. I'm going to have to guess false on this one. Hey, if you know someone that could experience the freedom <laughs> from the salad dressing bottle, then please like and share this video with them so they can make their own cold summer sauces this year. And hey, speaking of summer, you know, you got to change your cooking for the season, right? And there are five specific things that I do every year to make my cooking lighter, brighter, healthier, and honestly more appropriate for the season. The class is called Summer Cooking is Cool, and you can, use your, you can choose your class day and the time if you want when you go to webcookingclasses.com slash sun. So until next Tuesday at noon Eastern time, when we get even more clues toward breaking the Carefree Cooks code, this is Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's a method to your summer cooking success. Bye everyone.